Hi everyone, it's Amanda from the DNA Learning Center for another session of DNALC Live. Uh, this is a kitchen science section, so we're going to be doing an activity that should only require materials that you can find around your house to build a creature. And the creature that we're going to be building is going to look something like this little dude. But your creature, of course, could be different. Uh, and I'll explain how. My version of the creature looks like this, a little bit alien-like. And the traits that my creature has are going to be dependent on its parents and the genes, or alleles, we'll discuss that word in a moment, that are passed from the parents to the creature that we're going to be building, the offspring. So what I'm going to do is just start with a brief review of basic Mendelian genetics or heredity, and then we'll go ahead and, and we'll build our creatures. We'll get to the fun stuff. I'm going to switch to my screen, and our story starts with genes. So we're talking about heredity today, and a lot of people, when they hear the word heredity, they think of the passage of genes from one generation to the next. A gene is a piece of DNA that contains the instructions that will ultimately determine a living thing's traits. So your hair color, your eye color, freckles, dimples, all the things that make you, you, all have something to do with your genes and other factors as well. And what's interesting about the story of how we understand genetics is that it started a long time ago with this guy, Gregor Mendel. He was a monk who lived in Austria in the 1800s, and he observed the passage of traits from one generation to the next in pea plants. And you can see here pictures of some of the traits that he observed. Uh, so flower position, for example, uh, were the flowers on the top of the plant or on the side? Were the stems long or were they short? Were the peas themselves different shapes like round or wrinkled, different colors like green or yellow or colored or white? And then the pods themselves from the pea plants he was observing came in different varieties as well. We call all of these traits the plant's phenotypes. A phenotype is an observable trait. And Gregor Mendel knew that phenotypes were inherited. They were passed from one generation to the next. He just didn't know that it was genes that were determining the phenotype. He said that there were factors being passed from parent plants uh, to their offspring. We now know that it's genes or different forms of a genes called alleles that are being inherited. And those alleles contribute to the phenotype, the traits of a living thing. So I'm going to go back and approach this from a genetic story, a modern genetic story. And it all starts with how genes are passed from one generation to the next. Does anyone know what this is actually a picture of? I love this picture. This is a picture that was taken with an electron microscope of a structure called a chromosome. A chromosome is a big, long, thread-like molecule of DNA that's all very carefully folded into this tidy package. I'm making it look very messy, but it's really organized. And inside a chromosome, like if I had magic tweezers, what I would find is that there's whoops, strands of DNA with that nifty double helix shape, all condensed, all folded up. And along those strands of DNA are these sections that we call genes, the parts of the DNA that play a role in our phenotype, in our trait. So when we inherit genes from our parents, we're actually inheriting, inheriting them prepackaged in these structures called chromosomes. And I have a picture here, two pictures, of karyotypes. A karyotype is when you take all the chromosomes from a cell and you organize them into pairs. Uh, you'll see there's a female karyotype on the left-hand side and a male karyotype on the right-hand side. They're mostly the same. The only difference is the last set of chromosomes. We'll get to them in a minute. But let's just look at how they're sorted. You'll see that there's a pair here labeled number one. And then beside it is another pair labeled number two. In each pair, there are chromosomes from mom and dad. Yep, and if you were to count all of the chromosomes from this human karyotype, the total number of chromosomes should be 46 in an average human cell. 
23 of the chromosomes in this karyotype are inherited from a mother, and 23 are inherited from a father. So there's a whole set of chromosomes, numbers one through 23, that last pair, which we'll get to in a minute, from the mother, and then a whole second set from the father. In a karyotype, they're organized into pairs. So these, let's say two chromosome number fives, for example, have the same genes. What does that mean? So there could be, I'm going to make this up right now, a gene on chromosome number five, one little section of DNA that has the instructions for whether or not you're going to have lots and lots of freckles. So we could have a yes freckles or a no freckles version of that gene. One's from mom and one's from dad. So let's think about that. Let's say mom and dad both pass along an allele, a version of a gene for yes, having freckles. Will you have freckles? Why yes. What if mom and dad both pass along a gene for not having freckles? Will you have freckles? No, of course not. But what if you get one of each? What if one of these chromosomes has a gene for having freckles and one of them has a gene for not having freckles? Then what happens? Yikes. So part of what Mendel observed with his pea plants is exactly that how the factors or genes are passed from one generation to the next and how they interact with one another sometimes. They have behaviors to determine our traits. Let's just point out though the difference if you haven't noticed already between these two karyotypes. So both of them have 23 pairs of chromosomes and in each pair, one's from mom and one is from dad. There's pair one, two, three, four, all the way up to the 23rd pair. And it's that 23rd pair that varies between biological males and females. Do you see the difference? Yeah, so in the female karyotype, the last two chromosomes are both X chromosomes. So an X from mom and an X from dad. Uh, in the male karyotype, there's an X from mom and a Y from dad. The Y makes the guy, that's how I learned it. If that Y chromosome is there very early in development, that embryo will start developing uh, male structures as a result of that chromosome being present. Pretty cool. So I'm going to click forward and show you a tool that was developed by a scientist who came after Gregor Mendel's time to show how we can predict when alleles or genes are passed from one generation to the next, uh, what traits we might expect to see in the offspring. And the tool is called a Punnett square. It's named after Reginald Punnett. You'll see his name right over here. On a Punnett square, we can put a set of alleles from mom and a set of alleles from dad. And then in this tool itself, we can predict what alleles a child could inherit in pairs and then what phenotypes we might expect to see or traits. So I'm gonna use an icky example, but it's actually legit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss earwax with you briefly, yes earwax. It's just a matter of fact thing. And it turns out that there are two different kinds of earwax. Now this I'm going to make up. <laughs> some types of earwax are actually wet and some are more waxy and dry. Okay. I'm going to say that wet earwax is what we call a dominant trait. And I'm going to say that dry earwax is what we call a recessive trait. I'll be honest, I don't know which one is dominant and which one is recessive. <laughs> what do these words mean? They have to do with the way that these alleles or genes behave. So I'm gonna use this capital letter E to represent the dominant allele, the dominant version of this gene and a lowercase letter to represent the recessive version of this gene. When an allele or a gene is dominant, what does that mean? Well, it makes me think of my friends growing up. So I had a friend in my friend group that was very dominant. When she was there, you always knew she was there. She was kind of loud and bossy. And dominant alleles kind of work the same way. When they're there, they're very noisy, and you know they're right away. 
but recessive alleles are the exact opposite. So in my friend group, I also had a friend who was recessive. She could be there, but sometimes you wouldn't even know if she was there because she was kind of withdrawn and shy. And it turns out that recessive alleles behave that same way. If they're paired with a dominant allele, you won't even know that they're there. They're hidden. They can be passed on to the next generation, but they won't be expressed, meaning you won't see the trait that they encode. Let's look at a Punnett square and see how this works. Imagine in my little scenario here that I've got two parents and I'm going to say that these are the alleles that parent number one has. So let's just pretend that's mom. So capital E, oh, I made an A. We're not talking about A's right now. Lowercase e. That is mom's genotype. That is the set of alleles that she inherited from her parents that determine her phenotype. So if her genotype is big E, little e, what is her phenotype for earwax? So she's got one dominant allele and one recessive allele. If you said that she has wet earwax, you are right. If that dominant allele is present, in this case, that is the phenotype that we will see. So I'm just going to jot down that mom's got wet earwax. Delish. <laughs> now let's say dad has this genotype. So we have a lowercase e, lowercase e. What is his phenotype for earwax? Well, if he has two lowercase e's, this is pretty simple. He must have dry earwax. All right, so we've got two parents with two different phenotypes. So this is dad. And this is mom. All right, so now I can use this Punnett square to predict what combinations of alleles their children or offspring could inherit. This is not a predictor of the future. These are just the possibilities with regard to this one set of alleles. So in box number one right here, I am going to put a capital E from mom. And then from dad, it's a lowercase e. So one dominant allele and one recessive allele. There's one combination of alleles that their offspring could inherit. In the second box, we've got a lowercase e from dad and a lowercase e from mom. It's kind of like a multiplication table. So there's another combination of alleles that their offspring could inherit. All right, box number three down here. We've got a lowercase e from dad oh, and an uppercase e from mom. I always like to write the uppercase e first. So I'm going to fix this. There we go. And in the last box, looks like we've got a lowercase e from dad and an uppercase e from, or lowercase e from mom. All right, so what, are the, what does this tell me, this Punnett square? What are the chances that this set of parents inherit or pass along, my apologies, the phenotype of wet earwax? Could they possibly have a child who produces wet earwax just like their mother? Yeah, it looks like two out of the four squares on this Punnett square have genotypes for the wet earwax phenotype. That capital E is there. So if a child were in, to inherit either of these combinations, they're both the same, they would produce wet earwax. In this example over here, we've got two boxes that are little e, little e. So two alleles for dry earwax. So it looks like half of the boxes contain genotypes that would determine this phenotype, dry earwax. So what are the odds? Every time this mother and father have a child, there's a 50% chance they'll have a child with wet earwax and a 50% chance they'll have a child with dry. 
Mendel observed this kind of heredity pattern of dominant and recessive alleles in his pea plants without even knowing what an allele was. And he could predict the traits that the offspring would inherit and in what fractions without a Punnett square. Pretty amazing. So what we're going to do is we're going to use all of this knowledge of dominant and recessive alleles and how they interact to build a creature. Are you ready? <laughs> so what you have to do first if you're going to try this activity at home is you need to determine the phenotypes, the different traits that you want your particular creature to have. I'm going to propose the traits that I decided I wanted my creature to have, but yours might be different. So here I have a chart that shows the traits that I would like my creature to have and the alleles, the different forms of genes that my creature could inherit for these traits. So trait number one is antenna. And it looks like based on my chart, my creature could have two antennas or three antennas. And I have to choose a letter symbol to represent these alleles. So I'm going to make the allele for two antenna represented by a capital A and three antenna, I'm going to make a lowercase a. If it's a capital A, that means that that allele is dominant. And if it's a lowercase a, that means it's recessive. All right, second trait is going to be whether there's a curly tail or a straight tail. And I'm going to make the curly tail the dominant trait. And I'm going, oh, I don't want to do C. I'm going to make that T. Capital T, lowercase t. So curly tail is the dominant allele, and straight will be the recessive allele. Third trait, legs. So in my world, the creature's either going to have four legs or five legs. Four legs is going to be the dominant trait. Five legs will be the recessive trait. So we have an uppercase L, lowercase L. For body color, we're either going to do blue or green. I'm going to make blue the dominant, and I'm going to make green the recessive. Four. Eyes. So in my world, the creature has one eye, and it's determined by the dominant allele. If it has two eyes, it's recessive. And then finally, hair. Oops, I don't want to do an A. The uppercase H is no hair. That's the dominant allele. And lowercase h will be having hair, red hair on the head. <laughs> so these are the alleles that my parent monsters or creatures could have that will be passed on in different patterns to the offspring. Any questions so far? So the first thing you need to do at home is make a chart like this, okay? You're going to list the traits that you want your creature to have, and then the forms of those traits that could be passed. It's easy if you just stick with two. So it's either two antenna or three antenna, one eye or two eyes. And then you're going to assign symbols, letter symbols, for each of those traits. Those will represent the alleles that will be passed to the next generation. The second thing you need to do is figure out what the genotypes are for mom and dad creature. I've already done that to save a little bit of time. So here are mom and dad's genotypes. So don't forget, the genotype is the combination of alleles that are going to be uh, determining mom and dad's traits, their phenotypes. And these are the alleles that will be passed to the next generation. I know they look small right now. I'm going to make them bigger in a minute. And I selected them randomly. So I'm going to go back here so you can see a little bit better. 
So it looks like for antenna, which was represented by the letter A, mom's genotype is big A, little a, and dad's is little a, little a. What does this mean about them? What are their phenotypes? Well, I have a little cheat sheet in front of me, and I remember two antenna was the dominant trait, and three antenna was the recessive trait. So if two antennas is dominant, then the phenotype for mom is she has two antenna. And that's because she's got that capital A there. If that capital letter is there, that's the dominant allele, and that's the one you're going to see. But take a look at dad. He's got two lowercase a's, so that means he has the recessive trait, which is three antenna. So could we predict if mom and dad creature have a child, what are the chances that they'll have a child with two antenna or three antenna? Yeah, we could. We could do a Punnett square to show that. But let's go through this chart first. Second, tail. Curly tail is dominant. So take a look at mom here. She's got that dominant allele. So mom has a curly tail. And take a look at dad. He's got the same genotype. So he also has a curly tail. Third trait, B is body color. So what do we know about mom and dad? Well, blue is the dominant body color for our creatures. So if you see a capital B, like here, dad's got two capital Bs. So uh, he's double dominant there. He's got a blue body. And mom's got a green body. E. E is eyes. One eye is dominant. So take a look. Mom and dad both have that capital E, so they should both have one eye. L, remember what that was? Legs. Four legs is dominant. Five legs is recessive. Well, it looks like mom's got five legs. And dad, four. And then finally hair. Mom's got no hair. Dad, <laughs> red hair on his head. So what you need to do for part two is figure out what are mom and dad's genotypes, meaning what are the alleles that they can pass from one generation to the next. Now what I did just for fun, and this certainly isn't something you have to do at home, is I made models of mom and dad. <laughs> so take a look. This one's green. Who's that? Hmm. Looks like mom should be green. She should have one eye. Yes, curly tail. Antennas. I think I might have messed up the number of antennas there. <laughs> I built them just so you'd see a model of what they look like. There's red hair on this one. There's his eye. So we've got mom and dad monster, but again, I don't really need to build mom and dad. What I really need to know about mom and dad are the alleles that mom and dad can pass to offspring. And what I've done is I've taken these alleles and I've written them on strips of paper. So for example, I have Big A, little a, so that's mom's genotype for antenna. And there's little a, little a, that's dad's genotype for antenna. So mom has antenna, the dominant trait. Dad is the recessive trait. Two antennas, three antennas. What I'm going to do now is grab a pair of scissors. And I'm, actually I don't even have scissors. I'm gonna rip these up. So now I have a big A and a little a, those are mom's alleles. And now I have two little a's, these are dad's alleles. And what I need to do is I need to determine at random which alleles are going to be passed from mom and dad onto the offspring. This should be done randomly, okay? So you're not going to pick, in real life, mom and dad don't pick which alleles are being passed to the next generation. What I'm going to do is take moms and fold them up 
and dads and fold them up. And then mix them. And from each pile, so I have a pile of moms, two alleles, and dads, I'm going to select one at random. So one from dad, one from mom. And together, those will determine how many antenna the offspring or my baby creature is going to have. And look what I got. Can you see? Two little A's. So what does that mean about my baby offspring? How many antenna is it going to have? Mm, just like dad, little a, little a, three antenna. So I've got to keep track for each of these traits of which alleles my baby creature is inheriting from its parents, just by using these little squares of paper. And I would recommend making a chart. So I made a chart here. So for baby creature, trait number one, the antenna trait, I have two lowercase a's which is the recessive trait for having three antennae. So when I build my new creature, I know how many antennae it's supposed to have. What I need to do now is repeat the same thing for all of the traits. I've got my strips right here. I'm gonna make you watch me. So I've got hair. I've got one parent, two alleles, the other parent, two alleles. I'm gonna mix them up and at random, what do I get? Oh my gosh, is my baby creature going to have hair or not? Oh. Big H, little H, what does it all mean? Well, Big H, the dominant allele, is for not having any hair. So my little baby creature, no red hair. Hmm. Next one, legs. Do you remember what big L and little L were? I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to my key. Uh, big L is four legs. Little L is five legs. All right, so I've got moms and dads alleles. I'm folding them up. They're in my hands. Boop. And what do I get? Little L. Little L, two little L's. What does it mean? Five legs. My baby monster is going to have five legs. All right, so lowercase l, lowercase l, five legs. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm not going to make you watch me do this <laughs> six times. But what I will tell you is that you can save these pieces of paper because one fun activity would be to make a few different offspring. Do you think that they would all be the same or would they be different? I suspect that they would be different. Don't forget, this is random. And probably you're not going to get the same phenotype, the same six traits every time you randomly select the six traits. So let's say I've got mom and dad's alleles here for, what is E? Eyes. Let's say that for the baby we get big E, little E. Let's go back to the key. So big E is one eye, little E is two eyes. So the dominant allele is present. That means the baby's going to have one eye, just like both of its parents. Let's say B, body color. We've got a big B, big B, little B, little B. Uh-oh. We can predict with a Punnett square exactly how this is gonna go down. Let's give it a try. All right, so in this box, we've got big B, big B from mom and dad. In this box, big B, little B. In this box, 
Little bee, little bee. And in this box, oh, got a few options. Let's say at random I pick little bee, little bee. What trait would we expect to see? Well, with regard to body color, the recessive trait, which is what we're seeing here, two recessive alleles was green. So my baby monster is gonna be green. And finally, I'll do this one the real way. We've got T for tail. The dominant trait is a curly tail. The recessive trait is a straight tail. If I rip them up, there's mom's alleles. Here's dad's alleles. I'm gonna scrunch them. One from mom, one from dad. What's it gonna be? All right, last one. We got a little T and a big T. So we'll see the dominant trait, which is curly tail. So you got cool. Now we can get to building. So let me show you the materials that I have. I recycled some old egg crates and I cut individual parts of the egg crate to be the body of my creature. I have googly eyes. Now, if you don't have googly eyes at home, this is a googly eye in case you didn't know. If you don't have those, you can just cut paper circles to make eyes. I have pieces of pipe cleaner that I cut into leg length pieces. So I'm gonna use those to represent the legs. I have pins, but you could use toothpicks or anything. And these pins are going to be the antenna. If you're using pins, just be careful, they're very sharp. I found some paper clips around the house and I figured these would be good for tails because they're bendy. I could make them straight or I could make them curly. And I had a lot of pom-poms laying around the house, so I'm gonna use those for hair, but I don't think I'm gonna need them for this baby. You will see though, this parent has beautiful red hair. I used magic markers, big permanent markers to color the egg crates. In my first version, just to show you, I started using pom-poms to give them furry coats, which I really liked, but it took a long time and it was very messy. But if you've got time on your hands, Using colored pom-poms is a fun way to give them a kind of a textured uh, fur-like body. I'm gonna just stick with markers. So my creature, according to the randomly selected alleles, should have a green body. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to color my egg carton green. And please pardon the imperfection. I'm going to warn you right now, I am not a perfectionist. And if you are a perfectionist, the beauty is that you'll be doing this at home at your leisure. So you can start over if you're unhappy with the product, try different materials until you get a baby creature that you're happy with. I kind of like that mottled look. It's not completely green, a little spotty. All right, so I've got a green body, check. Boom, next. I'm going to attach the legs. So the legs are these little pipe cleaners and according to the randomly selected alleles, how many legs should I be attaching? It looks like, yep, this genotype determined that my baby creature was going to have five legs. So what I did was I actually pre-poked some holes. Oh darn, I colored the one without the holes. Hold on a minute. I pre-poked holes in the egg carton. So if you decide to use cardboard, like a shoe box or egg carton like I did, the pipe cleaners, I thought because they're metal inside, they'd go right through and it turns out they don't. Uh, so you're gonna have to pre-poke holes. You might need a grown up to help you with that. Uh, you can use a scissor. I can show you the tool that I used, which is kind of funny. Do I have it over here? <laughs> I used one of these, a metal skewer. <laughs> from my kitchen, yes, nice and pointy. But again, if you need to use pointy objects, just make sure you get some help. So I pre-poked holes and I made five holes just in case I needed five legs. So I put them in to the holes, push it through, and then I just fold the edges a little bit and twist it so that it stays put. 
they're not all exactly the same length. That's okay because what we can do is fold feet to help them stand up. But you do need to make sure that that leg is attached. You don't want your monster falling down. Here's number four. I keep saying monster instead of creature. I guess they're the same thing. All right, five legs. Beauty. Oh, it's coming together beautifully. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fold the pipe cleaners a little bit. Let's see. Yep, he stands. Or she, I don't know. All right, five legs. What else do we have? Uh, we don't have to worry about any hair, so I can check that one off. That's easy. The antenna. So I need to attach three antenna. On my creature, I'm going to use these push pins with these cute little yellow tops to be the antenna. So I just poke those through carefully. The cardboard holds them nice and tight so they're not sliding through. But you could use toothpicks. You could pretty much use anything. All right, I've got three antennas there. Perfect. Next, I'll do the tail. So for the tail, I'm going to use one of these bendy paper clips. I've already got one that I curled. So again, the easiest way to attach it is to have a pre-poked hole, which I did not do. Let's see if I can just attach it like this. Nope. All right. I'm going to make a hole. Where's my skewer? Who knew? that my barbecue skewer would come in handy for a genetics lab. All right, I'm gonna put that paper clip through the hole. Or not, hold on. I can't even see where I put the hole, people. This is what happens when you get old and you don't get glasses when you need them. Let me try again. Okay, there is indeed a hole. Boop. Okay. Like a fish hook. Now I'm just going to bend it and it should stay. All right, curly tail in place. Ta -da! And last, we need an eye. So this is the only thing that requires glue, on my monster anyway. Where do I want to put the eye? I think I'm going to put it right here. And of course, you're going to need to let it set for a little bit. So there's my creature, whose traits were determined by the selection of alleles from a mom creature and a dad creature. So there's my baby. Here's one proud parent. Do they look alike? There are some similarities and yet some differences. Here's the other proud parent. Hmm, a lot alike in many ways, but not exactly the same, some differences. And you might see this in your own family. I know that in my family, I have two brothers. We all inherited the alleles for blue eyes from our parents. They have blue eyes also. But then there are things that make us different. We're all different heights. Our hair colors are slightly different. One of my brothers is crazy freckles and the other one doesn't. So this is a great illustration of the inheritance of genetic traits from one generation to the next. And it kind of mimics what we see in our own families. What I would say is that it would be fun to create a whole family of creatures. Save your pieces of paper and make a few offspring and see if I'm right. I expect that probably they'll all be a little bit different, just like you and your siblings are all just a little bit different. I hope that you had fun, and we'll see you again soon on DNALC Live.